good. I'm not here for that. I'm here for you because your story matters. How you live it matters. And yes, even though it don't always feel like it out here in the middle of nowhere, but every, every single one of you matters. But before we get into all that, y'all want to hear one more song from Ashton? Yeah! If you sing it with her, because she's probably going to forget the words to this one, okay? I know you know we're going to take this back to the 80s. Let's see if your teachers can out sing you, okay? Here we go.
day job would come into assembly programs like this, right? I'd sit somewhere in the back, right? I'd be with my boys, right? I'd be the one kind of saying things that I shouldn't say out loud. You know what I'm talking about? I'd be the one kind of, I'd be the one kind of being annoying to the people around me. You know what I'm saying? I'd be the one, you know, kind of making fun of the speaker if he talked a little bit weird, like I do, or making fun of the speaker if she talked a little, said words weird, like I'm going to throughout this program, right? Like even if it was making sense a little bit, even if it was hitting a little bit deeper than I thought it would, I couldn't let anybody know. Because I had an image to protect, right? Big bad, big bad sophomore Corey couldn't let anybody know that something in school might actually be worth my time. Something in school might actually be a little bit fun. Something in school might actually make me think just a little bit. Uh -oh. Because when I was your guys' age, I thought the most important thing was what all y'all thought of me. Man, I did completely irrational things to never put myself in a vulnerable position. Or so I thought. Like, I remember one specific time. I was in seventh grade. And my buddy Robert, he threw a dance party. Anybody in here been to a dance party? Okay. For those of you who haven't, let me take you back. It was in the basement. All concrete walls, no windows, kind of like this auditorium. The lights were off. The disco ball was going. The strobe lights were flowing. No, I didn't grow up in the 70s. We just thought we were cool. Apparently, I haven't grown out of that face yet. Oh, yeah. And my buddy Robert, who was throwing the dance party, his nickname was DJ Lamb. So you know he was slinging the tunes, right? Best seventh grade DJ you ever met. So we're dancing, we're having a good time. All my friends were there. Girls were there. much better looking friends not paying attention to me at all. She was over there with you, Esben, and I'm like, this isn't good. I gotta do something, right? So I went over to DJ Lamb, I'm like, yo, DJ. He's like, yo, what's up? I'm like, hey, you see that girl over there? He's like, uh-huh. I'm like, yeah, I wanna dance with her. He's like, okay. I'm like, yeah, uh, she doesn't know I exist. She thinks Esben's hot stuff. Ain't paying attention to me at all. And he's like, that's not good, man. I'm like, yeah, so this is what I need you to do. I need you to play me a song that I can show off my moves. Yeah. And let her see that Aspen ain't got nothing on the Sea Monster. Sea Monster. And he's like, man, I'm DJ Lamb. Of course I can hook you up. He's like, you're up next. I'm over there stretching in the corner. I'm like, oh, it's about to go down. Aspen don't know what's about to happen. He hits play, and I'm all like, Peace up, eight town. to go. Like, you got no more time. And I'm like, oh, snap. I gotta come up with a plan fast. I'm like, okay, the bathroom's upstairs, everybody's downstairs, I run upstairs, go to the bathroom, go, I never even know. So I run upstairs, I go into the bathroom. We don't need to get into that. <laughs> but then, everybody started walking up the stairs. Because the seventh grade dance parties, at least when I was growing up, the parents were there and they made like pizza and had pop and chips. Yeah, everything was conveniently done in that moment. Plan A had been ruined. But because the most important thing to me back then was what you said about me or what you thought about me, I couldn't just risk walking out of the bathroom in front of my silly little seventh grade friends, risk them saying something stupid to make me look weird or whatever in front of that girl for 
Stick it up the bathroom, right? So I'm like, uh-uh, just wait it out. They can't be in for forever. Now, I was in there for what seemed like days. <laughs> now, there was cell phones back then. I'm not that old, but I didn't have one yet. My mama didn't love me that much. So I wasn't in there like Snapchat, Instagram, or making TikToks. No, I wasn't able to do what all y'all sophomore girls do in here and just waste hours on the For You page. No, it was just me. <laughs> COVID wasn't good for us. We're all addicted. Oh, not good. Yeah, it was just me, myself, and I. Bored out of my mind. After like four more days, I heard one of my friends from the kitchen say, where's Corey? Uh-oh. Like, I gotta do something, right? People don't just disappear from seventh grade dance parties, at least not when I was growing up. They're gonna call the cops, call my mom, think I got abducted, eaten by a bear. I'm like, okay, there's a window. I can jump out the window, run around the front of the house, walk in the front door, just say, see for me, say I needed some fresh air. I mean, I was dancing, I was sweating, kinda like I am now, they'd understand. The only problem was, it was the second story of the house. It was the middle of winter, so I'm like, yeah, I'm not a good idea. I had made a lot of poor life decisions up to that moment. But this was not about to be one of them. Break my ankle, stuck out there, get hypothermia and die? Not worth it. So I thought of every other option. I had to do something, but I couldn't think of anything other than to just face it. So I took a couple deep breaths in. I thought about my family back home. I grabbed the door handle. I opened the door. I stepped out. And nobody said anything about me being in the bathroom. Why would they, right? I was doing something that every single one of you in this room does. At least you should. If you don't, you need to go to the doctor. <laughs> but because I thought somebody might possibly say something to make me look silly, weird, whatever, in front of that girl, I didn't even take the chance. All because of a thought in my head of what you might say about me or what you might think about me, I didn't even take the chance I hid in that bathroom. Where do you hide? What do you guys hide behind when life gets tough? You see, this world has been talking a lot about these, these little things called masks lately, right? Like the last two years, you couldn't even have a conversation with your grandmother without this coming up, right? Families are being split up over these things, whether you're for them or against them. Your opinion was right, was right, right? Everybody's talking about it. It's like one of the most Googled words, like it's a new invention, like nobody's ever heard of this word. Like what in the world is this thing, right? Everybody's talking about it. Every can't turn on the TV without something talking about it. Everybody's talking about this thing like they've never heard of it, like they've never seen one, like they don't even know what it is but the reality is guys we've all been wearing masks long before COVID hit maybe you dress a certain way you talk a certain way you do things that you're not proud of you treat people like garbage see the reality is a lot of you walk through those hallways every single day and you're surrounded by a lot of people who think they know who you are but really all they know is your name and the stories that you tell them or whatever it is to try to fit in We've all been there, right? If I know it's late. I know it's, it's kind of like, man, he, he, this is deep, right? But if we really sit back and think about it, we've all been there, right? We've all hit behind something. The jokes, the popularity, the good looks, the seemingly perfect family, the big truck, the fancy car, the nice clothes, pretending like you don't care about nothing, treating everybody like garbage to try to look tough. Man, we've all been there at some point if we're actually honest with ourselves today. But we're not meant to stay there. Now, don't worry, I didn't come all this way. I didn't drive all over the countryside just to come to your school today to tell you how to live your life. I, I don't think I'm better than you. I don't think I know more than you, all right? I didn't come to try to get you to think I'm cool or funny or smart or anything like that. I'm well aware that I'm way more jacked up than any of y'all in this room, and I'm okay with that, all right? I'm just trying to do the best that I can, all right? I'm just here to leave you with a couple thoughts, all right? I know that being a teenager is hard. I know that it's even different than when I grew up, even though it really wasn't that long ago. And it used to be pretty easy to take a step back. It used to be pretty easy just to breathe a little bit. It used to be pretty easy just to shut things off, but now the world's going a million miles an hour, right? It's not so easy to convince yourself to put the phone in the other room for a little bit. Might actually be good for you because you, everybody's telling you if you get left behind, you're good. You can't. You're never going to catch up, right? Everybody's telling you you got to know what you're going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, next decade. And if you don't know, you're going to get left behind. Everybody's telling you you got to do more. You got to work harder. You got to go faster. You got to go faster. You got to go faster, right? And you're going to get left behind. It's not so easy just to take a step back now and appreciate the sitting. The person sitting next to you anymore because the world's constantly telling you you got to go faster 
You gotta do more. You gotta keep up. You can't miss out on those snap streaks. You, streaks. You can't. You can't miss out on what your friends are doing. Fear of missing out is not the same as what it was when I grew up. Yeah. Tell me about it. I'm the one standing in the light, sweating. It's really hot. That's okay. More long sleeve shirt just for you. It says, creep. She's like, oh, I don't think he knows it. That's what it says. It says creep. I bought it because I like the polka dots, not what it said. So I say it says creep because I think it sounds cooler. Yeah. Like creep. What are those made out of? Creep. The world, like life. Hey, stop laughing. Hey, only I can say that. I got the microphone. Life, like being a teenager is kind of like a roller coaster ride, right? Some days you're on top of the ride, everything's going great. You don't think life could get any better, man. The family's perfect. You got all the friends you could ever ask for. You're getting into the college that you want to. You're starting on whatever sports teams you want. You're getting good grades. Man, you're just coasting along. The girl that you like, she likes you back. The guy that you think is cute, he's giving you attention, right? Everything just seems perfect. You don't think life could get any better. You don't think anything bad could happen. You're just coasting. The next day you wake up, you're going downhill so fast, side to side, upside down. You want to throw up. You want to get off the ride. Maybe you come to school and you haven't always fit in. You, you kind of felt like you were just a shadow walking through those hallways, just invisible. And somebody finally gives you attention. People are coming up and saying, hey, you want to hang out? What are you doing later? Everybody's being nice to you. It seems strange, but finally you, you convince yourself that it's, it's real. And you sit back and you think to yourself, man, finally I fit in. Finally they notice me. Finally I belong here. Finally these guys aren't being jerks to me. Finally, they're paying attention. Finally, somebody wants to hang out, only to go home to see that everybody's laughing at you in that Snapchat thread or on that TikTok video because you actually believed that they wanted to be your friend. And it was all just some sick joke or some stupid TikTok challenge to get a laugh at your expense. Or maybe your parents sit you down for that conversation that you knew probably would happen, but you desperately hope never would. Life's kind of like a roller coaster ride, huh? I'm in the wrong room. It's not like that in Iowa. 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 Anybody in here like roller coasters? Okay, who doesn't like roller coasters? I'm with y'all, I hate them. I want nothing to do with them. They make me sick, make me dizzy. It takes me like 17 days to recover from those things. I want nothing to do with them, but my daughter, Macy, she loves roller coasters. That's just convenient, isn't it? That's how parenting works, apparently. Everything you love, they hate. Everything they hate, you love. Just how it works. But really, I gotta introduce Macy. Macy really is, let me see here if I can get this up. Maybe. Macy is, she's the sweetest little girl ever. Like, she does, she makes my job as a dad way too easy. Like, I don't know what I did to deserve a girl like her, but man, she makes my job way too easy. She's the sweetest, kindest little girl ever. Like, she takes care of me, right? Like, she, for example, she knows I'm allergic to cats. Like, I'm not gonna die if I'm around them, I just can't breathe. So anytime or anywhere where there is a cat, we can be outside on a 500 acre farm. If she sees a cat and I am with her, she will run up to that thing and say, hey! Excuse me, oh, my dad's allergic to you. Just move along here. Come on, move along. Chop, chop. Nothing to see here. Like, she will stay between me and that cat. It is so cute. Like, she will do whatever it takes to make sure her daddy's okay. Just the sweetest little girl ever. Until you get her in an amusement park. And then, she turns into a savage. <laughs> Let me explain. A while back, she was going into a new school. Um... She, she wasn't like switching districts. It's just her school's a little bit bigger than yours. Like in three grades, there's about 750 students. So there's a lot of different school buildings within the same town that you have to transfer to. You know what I'm talking about? Transfer to throughout throughout your school career like y'all probably did, right? And so she wasn't, she was just going to be the young kid again. She was going to be the young kid with the older kids. Now she's really sweet. But it takes her a while to warm up to people. Like maybe some of y'all are kind of shy, right? So she was just really nervous about like this, this new year. Like are the kids, you know, are the older kids, are they going to 
going to be nice? Like, are people going to make fun of me? Like, are, are those kids, you know, what's it going to be like? Like, all those rumors that spread through schools, even elementary schools, I don't know where they come from, but, like, I hope I don't give that teacher. I hear he gives a lot of homework on the weekends. I, I hope I don't give that teacher. I hear she yells a lot. Man, Dad, does this stuff that happens on TV really happen? Are swirlies still a thing? Do I fit in a locker? Do people do that, Dad? I'm like, girl, where do you hear this stuff? I take my summers off too. I wanted to enjoy the last little bit of my summer, but there was no way I was doing that with this nonsense going on. So sometimes, sometimes positive self-talk just doesn't work and you gotta go with some good old-fashioned distraction, right? So I'm like, hey Macy, what's one fun thing you wanna do before school starts to kinda get her mind off things, right? And she's like, oh, let's go to Hawaii. So I called my pilot Ted and he flew our jet to my private airspace back in Racine, Minnesota. We flew to Kona, Hawaii and spent 18 days on the beach. We saw a whale. I am just kidding. I said, girl, get real. Like your daddy's not a baller. Like what's one fun thing within two hours of us that we can take the minivan to? <laughs> Y'all laugh, but that thing's bougie, all right? You be jealous, it's sitting right out there. Listen, Esmond. You want to be a man? Drop a van. Hashtag <laughs> be a man, drop a van. All right? Yeah, so she's like, Dad, let's go to Valley Fair. Now, Valley Fair is an amusement park up by Minneapolis, Minnesota, about an hour and a half from where I live. Now, I hate roller coasters, but I want to be a good dad, whatever. So me, my friend Amber and Macy, we went to Valley Fair, and this is where I met Savage Macy. The first thing she sees when you walk into the park is this ride called North Star. It is a 230 foot high swing that hurls you through the air at 40 miles an hour. She sees this thing, starts foaming from the mouth, gets this look in her eye that I've never seen before and goes, Dad, let's go on that one. I said, I'm not going on that one, baby girl. You're going to have to go with Amber. So her and Amber go and get on this ride, and I'm freaking out. Like, I'm watching my baby girl about to go on this thing she could die on, right? This was the moment that I realized that I had officially gone from, like, that young, cool, hip dad to just dad. <laughs> As I'm standing there freaking out. Like, I'm losing my stinking mind. Like, I'm standing outside that gated area. You know how they put that fence on the bottom of the rides in case kids fall off so you can hit by them and stuff? Now, so I'm standing outside that gated area and I'm freaking out. I'm like, I'm like, look, don't look, look, don't look. You gotta look in case something happens. You gotta at least try to help me. You can't look. You're gonna pee your pants. You're gonna pass out. I was a hot mess. People looking at me, what is wrong with this guy? This place is supposed to be fun. Oh! Ride finally gets over, and I'm like, oh, thank God we can go home now. She runs up to me, and she goes, Dad, Dad, boss, what's up? She looks over at this ride called Steel Venom, which is bigger, stronger, scary, faster. It goes about 60, 70 miles an hour. She goes, Dad, let's go on that one. I said, I'm not going on that one either, baby girl. You're going to have to go with Amber again. Stop talking like that. You're scared of me. <laughs> so her and Amber, they went and got on this ride. Now, this happened more times than I care to admit. Like, after a while, I could tell she was getting kind of bummed out. Like, I knew what she was thinking without her having to say what she was thinking. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I knew exactly what was going on up there. Like, come on, Dad. Why did we even come here if you're just going to ruin all the fun? Come on, Dad. Why are you so lame? Come on, Dad. Like, you're some big, bad, motivational speaker. Teach people try to think face to face. What if I told the truth about you? Just something chicken. <laughs> Can't let my baby girl think that about me. So I puffed up my chest. Dumbest thing I've ever done. I looked over at Macy, I said, Macy, the next ride you want to go on, your dad, your hero, will go on it with you. And her eyes lit up and she started looking around Valley Fair for what ride she was going to take dad on. And she saw this. And she said, dad, let's go. And I said, okay. <laughs> So we get in line for delirious not just secretly hoping, wishing, praying for a storm, something that would shut the park down, so I didn't actually have to ride this thing, but I didn't have to let it on. Uh-uh, wasn't my luck that day. So we get in the little car thing, we sit down, we pull the harness over us, you know what I'm talking about, that hard, rubbery, plastic thing, straps in the middle, Peter from Valley Fair with like a half-eaten peanut butter and banana sandwich in one hand, texting his mom or grandma and the other, comes over and like acts like he's checking to make sure everything's good and safe, you know what I'm talking about? Do they really check? Not a chance. <laughs> I look over at Macy and there's like a six inch gap between where her shoulders are and where the harness is because she's short, right? But I didn't have time to worry about that. I got to focus on my breathing. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Just look straight ahead. It's only one minute long. You can do this for, for Macy. It'll be over before you know it. So the ride starts and it goes around and around and around. And the next time around, it stops upside down. 
I look over at Macy and she's falling out of her seat. I go to grab her, but I can't reach. But right before she fell all the way off that ride, that harness caught her. Right, her butt came off the seat six inches until her shoulders met the harness. You know that feeling? If you've ever been on a ride that goes upside down and your butt comes off the seat and you're like, <laughs> I'm dying. My heart stopped. Yeah. Even though from that six inches when her butt came off the seat to where her shoulders met the harness, even though in that six inch free fall, she thought she was going to die. Even though in that six inches, she probably was pretty stinking terrified. Even though in that six inch free fall, she probably tickled the pants just a little bit. Even though it was terrifying, the harness did exactly what it was supposed to, right? It kept her safe, and it kept her in that ride. Who's your harness? Who do you surround yourself with, Esben? When the ride of life has you hanging upside down with nothing to hang on to, will keep you from falling all the way off your ride. See, y'all know, you've lived long enough, whether you want to admit it or not, that there's going to be days when you fall, right? There's going to be days when all the hard work, when all the goals, when all the planning, when everything that seemed to be going so great, seemed to be going so perfect, all of a sudden looks like somebody dropped a grenade on it. Days when she don't want to talk to you anymore. Days when he don't want to look at you anymore. Days when you don't even want to look anybody in the eye because you made so many stupid decisions and you're so ashamed about it or so ashamed of what happened. Days when you don't want to get out of bed. Days when you don't want to come to school. Days for some of you when you don't even want to take another breath. And those are the days, guys, when it's so important to have people who know the real you. Behind all the jokes. Behind all the hooting and hollering. Behind the big muscles and the fancy cars and the good looks and the grades and the popularity. Whatever it is. See, those things aren't bad in and of themselves, guys. But when it prevents people from knowing who we really are, and that's all people ever see, that's when it gets dangerous. You see, you need people who know the real you behind the mask, who can step in on those days when you don't know what to do, days when nobody seems to be there, when you can pick up the phone, when you can walk into the room, when you can sit down at the table with and say, hey, can we talk? Somebody who can step in and be your harness and keep you from falling all the way off your mind. See, when I was your guys' age, I was like, maybe some of y'all in this room, I didn't think I needed anybody. I thought the jokes, the popularity, the girls, the parties, I thought all that was enough, so I didn't listen to anybody. But then the ride of life, it took a hard turn on me. See, I've been hung upside down literally on that stupid, delirious ride, and figuratively on the ride of life. The thing that affected me most growing up when I sat in chairs like you guys are today. The thing that I would have given everything else up for. Man, I have what you guys think that you want. I had what you guys think is going to make high school so much better for you. I was popular. I had, many, I had as many friends as I wanted. I started both ways on the football team. We made it to state. The girls used to think I was cute. I threw all the cool parties that people wanted to be invited to. I didn't have a curfew. I could do whatever I wanted. My teachers let me do whatever I wanted. I got away with everything. All my friends thought they wanted my life. All my friends said, man, my teachers are too strict on me. My parents are too strict on me. I wish I could have his life. I wish I could, could run around with him and do all that stuff that he was doing. But what they didn't know was I would have given all that up in a heartbeat for the one thing that most of them did have that I didn't. And that was a relationship with my dad. Like, I remember even on the nights that he was home, he would just sit in the living room and watch TV. But I, I wasn't allowed to go in there because he needed to relax and I was too noisy. So even though we lived in a three-bedroom, one-bathroom house with seven people, it felt so empty in there most nights. It messed me up. I made a lot of mistakes because of it. Try, trying to keep people at an arm's length away so nobody saw the cracks. Trying to make sure that nobody saw the quote-unquote weakness in Corey's life. Trying to make sure that nobody knew what was actually going on at home. Trying to make sure that nobody knew what kind of thoughts were actually in my head. Trying to make sure that people only saw the story of Corey that I wanted people to know. That only they only saw the cool, calm, and collected part of my life. Trying to remember the lies, the stories, the manipulation, all that stuff to try to make sure I kept everything straight. 
I would go from feeling worthless and depressed because my own dad didn't even want to spend time with me to being angry and lashing out just trying to get someone or something to fill that void. It was that feeling of him being my hero and wanting nothing more than for him to be there and care about me on one end and on the other just being so stinking mad at him and wishing he would go away forever. After he left my mom when I was 14 years old, we rarely talked. I mean, we didn't know each other. We were just strangers occupying each other's space. It was like that all the way through high school, but then after I graduated, he did reach back out to me. He wanted to try to make things right. He wanted to try to have a relationship to kind of start over, start fresh. But even though I had sat up so many nights and just wished that this conversation would happen, I sat up so many nights when nobody else was around and just wished that this moment would come. Just wished I would have a chance. Even though that's all I wanted in the moment when I possibly could have had it, 18-year-old court was way too bitter, way too angry. I wasn't willing to let go of the past, so I said, no way. Forget it. You had your chance. Get lost. You ever said something you didn't mean in a hot minute? Wish you could put the words back in your mouth. So it continued like that. Then January 5th came, a night that I remember for more reasons than one. You see, it was 7.30 and I had just got off work at the Mayo Clinic and I hadn't looked at my phone since like 5.30 at my last break. And y'all know that's way too long to go without checking your phone, right? That's way too long to go without getting caught up on everything, right? So before I could even punch out for the night, I pulled out my phone so I could go check on everything, see if I had any notifications, didn't have any, see if I had any text messages, didn't have, didn't have any, see if I had any missed calls, had one. And a voicemail from my dad. It seemed strange because I had never got a voicemail from him in my entire life. So I went to it right away. I, I clicked on it, and this is what I heard. Yeah, this is your dad. Just wanted to let you know that I always did love you, buddy. Bye. I was overcome with emotion. So you guys got to know something about me. I was... 19 years old at the time that my dad left me that message and I had waited my entire life up to that moment to hear him say those three words to me. But I knew something wasn't right. I could hear it in his voice. My heart started pounding as I ran to my car so I could go check on him at a shop. Each time I called with no answer, I became more worried. I finally pulled down the driveway of a shop where I saw two Mauer County Sheriff's deputies. I threw my car in park. What's going on? I'm Mark's son, is he here? He said no. But we have deputies all over in a three-county radius trying to find him. He said your mom called us and said that she's worried about him. Said he's been saying some things that he normally wouldn't say. So he said, you have my word. We will do whatever it takes for however long it takes to make sure that tonight ends the way that it's supposed to. To make sure that your dad gets the help that he needs. The wind chill that night back home in Racine, Minnesota was below zero. As I stood there numb. Trying to call my dad with no answer. Five, 10, 15 minutes went by, nothing. 20, 25, 30, 45 minutes, still nothing. Finally, after about an hour, my, my mom pulled down the driveway with my uncle. She could barely even stand when she got out of the car. Mom, what's going on? What's going on, Mom? Have you talked to Dad? Yes, Corey. I begged him not to do this. I begged him, Corey, but he won't listen to me. He won't listen, Corey. I grabbed my mom's phone out of her hand and I called my dad and he finally picked up. Yeah? Dad, what are you doing? What's going on? What do you care? You said yourself, you don't care if we ever talk again. You don't care if we ever see each other again. You don't care if I ever meet your daughter. Why do you care? No, Dad, please. I said that out of anger. Please, Dad. Dad, please don't do this. Please, Dad. I'm sorry. Please. Dad, please don't do this. He said it's too late, and he hung up the phone. A few minutes passed what seemed like an eternity. One of the sheriff's deputies was able to get my dad back on the phone. Mark, it's Deputy Blank with the Mauer County Sheriff's Department. What can I do to get you out of this situation? What can I do to help? I understand, Mark, but please, there's a better way. Please, Mark, just listen to me for one second. Just let me help you, Mark. Please, just listen to me. Mark, please, Mark, please, just put the gun down and... At that moment, I watched as 
that officer fell to his knees, slammed the phone down on his squad car and just shook his head. He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I tried. But there was a gunshot and the phone went blank. Ten days before he became a grandpa to my Macy, my dad pulled the trigger and ended his life. We buried him on my little brother's 18th birthday, his senior year of high school. For the next two to three years, I, I beat myself up. I replayed everything I'd ever said, everything I'd ever done. I thought it was my fault the regret was ruining my life. I thought I was just a lost cause, just damaged goods, like there was no way out. Like I was just another statistic. Like there was nothing that I could possibly do to ever recover from this. Like there was nothing I could possibly do to actually enjoy life. Like there was nothing I could possibly do to be a good dad for Macy. Man, I was just lost. Deep, dark, the depression, anxiety, and panic attacks were so bad that I could barely even function, literally could barely breathe. I literally would wake up in the morning and the only goal, the only focus, it wasn't to have a good day. It wasn't to accomplish anything. It was simply to get to the end of the day so I could go back to sleep because that was the only time I wasn't tormented by my thoughts. That was the only time I had any sort of peace. I wasn't living. I was simply existing. Free fall my ride with nothing to catch me because I didn't think I needed anybody so when I did need somebody I had already pushed everybody away because I thought I knew everything but thankfully through this crazy turn of events I met this guy named Jake and, and Jake he started to become my harness I don't know I must have finally just been broken enough I must have finally just been desperate enough that for the first time in my life I actually trusted somebody that for the first time in my life I actually listened to somebody that for the first time in my life I actually looked the real Corey in the mirror put the mask down just a little bit and said hey you know, maybe there's some things I can do different. Maybe there's some things I can address. Maybe projecting my pain and treating everybody like garbage, partying, sleeping around, maybe all that stuff isn't enough to get me through this. Maybe all this stuff isn't actually gonna make everything okay and just magically disappear. And for the first time in my life, I actually listened to somebody and actually trusted somebody. And Jake, he came to my life when I could barely even breathe. And he would say things like, hey, Corey, I don't know exactly what it's like to live your story. I don't know exactly what it's like to feel your pain. But he said, this is what I do know that just like a hundred dollar bill you can take it you can crumple it up you can spit on it you can rip it in half tape it back together you can rub it in mud you can make it look make it look as disgusting and nasty and jacked up as you want it to you can call it whatever horrible name you want and then you can uncrumple it dry it off walk into any store lay it down on the counter and they won't ask any questions because it's still worth a hundred dollars he said that's the same for you, Corey. That you may feel like just a crumpled up piece of garbage. That the world around you, the people in your life might see your mess, your circumstances, your family, your mistakes, your decisions, and see just a balled up piece of trash. He said you might even feel like you'd be doing the people around you a favor if you didn't show up tomorrow. So they don't have to pick up the pieces. So they don't have to clean up the mess that you made. But he said, that's not true, Corey. He said, you're worth the same now as jacked up and as messed up, as nasty and broken and as embarrassing and as, and, and as embarrassing as your dollar bill life might look. You're worth the same now with all the scars, the bruises, the marks, the regrets, the shame, the doubt, with all that stuff on there as you were before any of that stuff got on. And that's exactly why I'm here with you guys today. That's exactly why I'm up here spitting, pitting out giving it everything I got. That's exactly why I spent 17 hours about in a car this week, and this is the 11th time I've done this since Monday morning, but I don't care. I'm gonna give it everything I got, even though I'm tired and my voice hurts, and it takes a lot just for me to get up here, and my back hurts from doing that stupid dance 11 times this week, right, because I'm too old for that, but I'm gonna stand up here and give it everything I got, because I get to tell you exactly what Jake told me all those years ago. See, I don't know your guys' stories. There's way too many in here to know them all. But this is what I do know, that I, 
I've been really fortunate, guys. I get to travel all over. I joke about, about it being hard, and it is hard, but I wouldn't ask for anything other than the world. Like, it's the best thing in the world what I get to do. I get to travel all over this world. I've got to speak to a lot of people from really young to really old, from really rich to really poor, from really popular to the person who feels invisible, and nobody would know if they didn't show up tomorrow, from black to white and everywhere in between. And this is what I found out in all the years of my travel that every single one of us, yes, even the prettiest girl in here, yes, the person who can bench press the most, the valedictorian, the star athlete, yes, the person sitting next to you who you think has the perfect life and you wish they had you that you had theirs. Yes, even your teachers. We all have things that we think about when nobody else is around. That at night when everything shuts off and we don't have to impress anybody, we, we wake up in the middle of the night, it pops in our head, just keeps replaying. We try to we try to pull something out of phone, the Spotify, whatever, to try and drown it out so we don't have to think about it. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's something that was said about you or done to you in those hallways or written about you online. Maybe when you look in a mirror, tears roll down your face because you hate the way that you look. People laugh at you. People make fun of you. Maybe you're born different. You have a quote-unquote disability. And every single day, people make fun of you. Every single day, people laugh. Every single day, people make fun. Every single day, you're the butt of the joke. Every single day, many people don't know what makes you so different and you desperately don't want anybody to know. So you're always trying to remember the stories. You're always trying to remember the lies. You're always trying to remember the circumstances so you can make sure that nobody finds out why you had to leave that last school. So nobody finds out who you really live with. So nobody finds out who you go home to at night. So nobody finds out you, where you're from, what's been done to you, what you've been through, so nobody knows. That thing that you're not even allowed to talk about because it's too gross and society tells you we don't talk about that stuff. Maybe you're the star athlete and you ask yourself, man, if I didn't score all the touchdowns, make all the baskets, have all the kills, would people still care? If I didn't always have a joke around from the friends around me to make them laugh, would they still want me in the room? Or is that all I'm good for? Like, what if I, what if I have a bad day one day? Are they still gonna be there? What if I stop doing the stupid things that they do? Are they still going to want to hang out? What if I didn't get straight A's? Would my parents still love me? Would they still brag about me to their friends? What would they say? What would they think if they actually knew what went on in my head? What would they think if they actually knew the decisions that I've made and the things that I've done? What if they knew them? things I put into my body? What if they knew what my arms looked like underneath these sleeves? What if they knew what really happened to me back then? What would they do? Well, we don't tell anybody because the last people that we told walked out on us. The last people that we told laughed in our face. We don't want to tell our parents what they did to us because we don't want them to blame themselves. We don't want to have that conversation with a teacher or a counselor that might actually get us some help because you don't want to be the project student anymore. You just want to be normal for one day. So instead of actually having hard conversations or being real with people, we just keep walking every single day wondering if anybody would actually care if they knew who I was. I don't know what those thoughts are for you. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you go home to at night. I don't know why you had to leave that last school. I don't know what's been done to you. I don't know what kind of horrible things have been said to you, what kind of lies that have been spoken over you, what kind of things that you believe over yourself. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've done. I don't know who walked out on you. I don't know who said what to you. I don't know who said they didn't want you anymore, but this is what I do know, that every single one of you has value. That no matter where you've been, what you've done, every single one of you has something that somebody in this room needs. So don't ever believe the lie that if you didn't show up tomorrow, you'd be doing us a favor, guys. Through all the pain, shame, regret, and disappointment of your past and everything that's sure to happen in your future as life goes on and throws its punches at us like it does. One thing will always remain true. Never forget this now ever. No matter how old you are, no matter where you find yourself, no matter who tries to tell you otherwise, never forget that you matter. No matter where you are, where you find yourself, you matter. Never believe anything other than that. And if that's true for you, it means it's true for everybody else in this room. No matter if we believe, if we believe the same as they do, no matter if we do the same things, no matter if we look the same, no matter if we even like talking to them. 
If that's true for you, it's true for everybody else. Don't ever believe the lie that if you didn't show up tomorrow, we would miss you. We need you here. So Jake, he would say things like this, and at first, I was like, at first I kind of had that wall built up, right? Like some of y'all had that wall built up so high, right? Trying to make sure that nobody saw behind the, the facade, trying to make sure that nobody saw the real court, right? Trying to make sure that it only saw the polished court, right? But after a while, man, that wall started to crumble. That wall started to break down, right? I started to change, started to change the way I saw myself. It started to change the way I saw my future. I started to share my dreams and goals with Jake. I started to give him permission. I gave him permission to have the hard conversations with me. I gave him permission to have the awkward conversations with me. Me. I gave him permission to actually care about me. I gave him permission to actually be a real friend and grab me by the shoulders and look me in the eye when I was doing stupid things and say, hey, there's a cliff and you're running off of it. You might want to think about the things that you're doing. You might want to think about the way that you're living. Otherwise, you're going to end up running off a cliff. I gave him permission to actually care about me, to actually tell me what I needed to hear and not what I thought I always wanted to hear. And let me tell you, he did and It's not fun. And there was many days I wanted to punch him in the throat, but I didn't. Not because I'm a good person, but because he's 6'3", and I'm not. <laughs> and after a while of this, uh, he came to me and he, one day he said, Corey, I got to talk to you about something. He said, I got to talk to you about the relationship with your dad. All that bitterness, anger, resentment, all that weight that you're carrying, pretending like it's not there. That thing that you don't want to let go of, that thing that you want to keep burying, that thing that you want to keep running from. Yeah, Corey, it's ruining your life. It's preventing you from going the places that you want to go and from becoming the person that you want to become. So what did I do? I did what most of us do, would do in that moment. I got mad, right? Because we think if we can blow up at him, if we can get him out of our face, we don't have to deal with it quite yet. We don't have to talk about it quite yet. We can bury it for one more day, one more week, one more month. Because it's scary to deal with those things even though we know we need to we don't want to right so I blew up at him and he said Corey I'm not telling you how to live your life I'm not telling you what to do so he said I can either walk out that door and let you keep dragging that weight trying to do this and wondering why it's not working or I can walk alongside you every step of the way no matter what this process looks like I'll be there for you so I took the next couple months and I talked to some people read some books and did a lot of reflecting in this one day I came across this exercise that really changed my, my mind on everything, really kind of made things make sense. And I want everybody in here to do this real quick. Everybody in here take a deep breath in, biggest breath as you can. Come on, this is your chance to show off, guys. Biggest breath as you can. Don't exhale till I tell you to. Okay, now take another deep breath in. Don't exhale yet. Okay, now another deep breath in. Don't exhale. Okay, now another breath. Come on, don't exhale. You can take a bigger breath than that. Come on, another breath. Come on, don't exhale. Another breath. Come on, another breath. Come on, another breath. Come on, another breath. Come on, another breath, come on, another breath, come on, another breath, come on, another breath, come on, boy, stop it, another breath, come on, another breath, okay, you can let it out. What happened? You eventually couldn't breathe, right? If you went to cough or had some way to let that air out, you would have suffocated. All the while I was up here breathing just fine. It was actually kind of funny watching y'all. And this person said to me that day, they said, Corey, that's exactly what it's like to live in the past. They said, you may think that you're getting back at the people that hurt you and did you wrong. You may think that you're doing the right thing by beating yourself up and covering yourself in all that shame for the mistakes that you made. But he said, really, all you're doing is choking the life out of yourself, sabotaging the day before it even starts, not giving yourself a single chance. And they said, contrary to what a lot of us believe, forgiveness isn't pretending like it didn't happen. It's not burying it away somewhere deep and dark and never talking about it again and ignoring it. It's not saying that what you did is okay. It's not saying that what they, they did is okay. It's not saying that it doesn't still hurt sometimes. It's simply the decision to breathe. To let some of that air out so you can take in some fresh air. So you can make some new memories, some new friends, some new relationships. The decision to say, yeah, it was messy. Yeah, it's not fair. Yeah, I shouldn't have made that mistake. I'm still paying for the consequences and it sucks. That shouldn't have happened, but I can take one more step. I can take one more breath. I can go one more day. I can have one more conversation. And so after hearing this and all this stuff, I went back to Jake and I'm like, all right, Jake, what's step one or whatever? And he said, I want you to write a letter to your dad. Even though he's not alive, obviously, he won't read it. 
but he said there's something that happens psychologically when you put pen to paper. So he said, I want you just to sit down and start writing. However much, however little you want to write, no rules, just whatever you got to say, just put it down on paper. So about nine years ago, I sat down and I wrote that letter sitting right over there. I wrote it, stuffed it in a desk for about seven years. I didn't look at it. Still to this day, my family hasn't seen this letter. Nobody's seen this letter other than students all over this country like you guys. So if you don't mind, I, do you guys got a little bit more time? Is it okay if I read some of it to you? Yeah. You, got it. you guys good? The weight room can wait a little bit. Dear Dad, I wanted to write this letter to bring closure to the past. I want to say sorry for the way I treated you. I was disrespectful and did not accept your authority. I guess I was just afraid to get close to you and then lose you. I really do wish we would have had a better relationship. All I wanted growing up was to make you proud and have you tell me good job. I have a kid now, so it's easier for me to see where you're coming from to a point. I know I can never get the lost time back and it really disappoints me, but through all the letdowns and pain, I still do love you and forgive you for all of it. My daughter's name is Macy. She'll be two on January 15th. She's the most beautiful little girl ever with curly blonde hair and blue eyes. You would have loved playing with her. She's full of energy and of course has your strong will. I hope I can make you proud. I know you didn't mean to do what you did, but it hurt all of us terribly. It is something that will never go away. I still think about it a lot and wonder why it happened or what I could have done to change it. I wish it didn't end like that, but it did. And there's nothing that can change that. But I came here today to tell you that I sincerely forgive you for everything. And I hope you can forgive me too. I'm proud to call you my dad. And I strive to be a good son. I forgive you. I love you, Dad. Bye. You see, to some of y'all, that's just a pen on a piece of paper. Like, it don't mean nothing to you. But to me, this letter allowed me to breathe again. Allowed me to start living again. No, it's, it's not the letter that changed everything. Don't get confused. It's the decisions that I made it's the process that I went through to say, hey, maybe I can trust some people. Maybe I need to have some conversations. Maybe there's some things that I need to do differently. Maybe running from all my problems isn't going to solve it. Maybe treating people like garbage isn't going to make me actually feel tough. Maybe putting substances, doing drugs, drinking, sleeping around, all this stuff isn't actually going to numb the pain. Maybe there's some real things that I need to do. But I never would have wrote this letter if it wasn't for Jake. I never would have wrote this letter. I'd still be in a basement somewhere if I even was alive. If it wasn't for somebody like a name on that screen, I never would have wrote that letter. I sure wouldn't be here with you guys today. If I still was trying to prove to all you guys that I was enough. If I still was trying to prove to all you guys that I was tough. If I still was keeping everybody at an arm's length away so nobody saw the cracks. So people only saw what I wanted them to see. So people only saw the polished, cool, calm, and collected, Corey. I don't know where I'd be. I know I won't be doing what I'm doing now. I don't know if I'd be alive, but I know for sure I wouldn't have the relationship that I have with my daughter that I do. So I wanna encourage every single one of you to find somebody. Find somebody to be your harness. Find somebody that you can get real with. Somebody who you let hold you accountable. Somebody who you share your goals, your dreams. You have those those dangerous conversations when you say, hey, I want to be this because they're dangerous because then they're going to hold you accountable to it and give them permission to look you in the eye and say, hey, you need to think about what you're doing. Hey, you need to, you need to stop and think. Give them permission to have the awkward conversations, the hard conversations. Be real with them. Find those people, guys. Be brave enough. Be strong enough to say, you know what? I can't do it all on my own because we're not meant to. And the third and final question before we go is this. What's one thing that you can let go of today? 
No, I didn't say what's one thing you can erase from your memories and it's all rainbows and unicorns from here on out. That's not how life works. I wish it was. But what's one step forward you can take today? What's one positive thing you can do today for you today? Maybe some of you need to write your own letter. Maybe you're like me and you've treated some people and you're like garbage and you've projected your pain onto so many people trying to make sure that people know you're tough, trying to make sure that nobody sees the weakness and you need to go and apologize to somebody and say, hey, I'm sorry for being a jerk. I'm sorry for treating you like that. I'm not going to do that anymore. Maybe some of you have been putting substance in your, in your body to try to fit in or try to numb the pain. And you need to have the hard conversation with somebody and say, hey, this is where I'm at. I need some help. Maybe some of you can't even wear short sleeves because you got so many scars all over your body. And you need to have that conversation with somebody and say, hey, this is where I'm at. I need some help. Maybe you need to have some conversations with teachers and say, hey, can you help me hold me accountable to my grades? I'm sorry for sabotaging my school career just because life at home sucks doesn't mean I need to ruin everything else in my life. And you need to have some hard conversations. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe all it is is that when you go home today, you just take 30 seconds and look whoever you live with in the eye and say, hey, I know I don't say this very often, but thank you for what you do. I appreciate it. I love you. I don't know what it is, but in just a second, Ashton's going to sing one more song. During that song, there's pieces of paper and markers up, up here on both sides of the stage and back in the corner. Go find a piece of paper and a marker. Write down that one thing. Don't put your name on it. It's not for me to decide whether it's good enough. It's not for me to decide what it is. That's between you and that piece of paper. That's just you saying, you know what? I'm just going to take one step. Not be perfect. I'm going to take one step forward today. After that, just go. If you need to make it right with somebody, this is your moment. If you need to apologize to somebody, this is your moment. If you need to get your friend back, this is your moment. And then just go find as many people as you can. Give them a hug, high five, handshake, fist bump, whatever you're comfortable with, and let them know that they belong here at this school. Let them know that you may not know why the tears are rolling down their face, but they don't have to get through whatever it is alone. Let them know that you got their back. So on the count of three, everybody on your feet, one, two, three, go!